All right, for our last subject of the week, we're going to talk about simple and complex path following. So first off, what is it, this path following thing? Well, path following, unlike path finding, is following a established path. So path finding is uh, effectively trying to find a path between one point and another point given a set of obstacles and other environmental factors and so on or predicting what the ideal path is between two points. Um, so say you are making a game and you have such a AI that's trying to figure out how to get from one place to another place then determines that the ideal path is this wacky uh, scribbly line. Well how does it follow that path? Well that's what path following is for. So path can be dynamically generated. Um, algorithms like A star or Dijkstra's algorithm can be used to determine a, the ideal and the, the most optimal path between two locations based on uh, you know what's possible and, and what's uh, optimal. Um, but uh, we can also put paths in graphically or or um, programmatically. Right? We can say, okay, here are ten points on a path, and please please agent follow that path. Uh, while also adhering to other behaviors such as, for example, uh, fleeing, seeking, and so on, as we've been talking about. So, uh, you know, if you just make an object follow a path um, kind of mechanically, it'll look mechanical, right? Our agents want to respond to other things apart from being on a path such as dangers or rewards or other agents, right? So, um, pathfinding can become a relatively uh, interesting, an additional um, thing we layer on top of all these other behaviors that we've been chatting about. And so you can kind of think of a path just initially at the fundamental point as a just set of points, really. Um, really it's just a, um, a you know a set of, of uh, points and um, directed vectors or a directed um, cyclic or acyclic graph uh ultimately um but most of the time you don't you only have like one loop you don't have multiple branches on a path that's not nece necessarily true so like a path can be a graph you can have multiple points maybe you can create a path with individual points that have a probability of going one direction or the other so you can kind of see how more complicated interesting paths can be created say you get to a fork in the road, likelihood of going left or right. But in the context of this lecture, we're only going to be talking about paths with one, uh, one loop or a line. There's no, there's, no, uh, there's no cycle in the graph. Um, but ultimately, the edges are directed. So it's a directed graph. Um, and and uh, that's a very important point, because otherwise you wouldn't know which direction to go. So uh, paths do have a starting point and generally have an ending point, although you can have graphs that the uh, paths that loop on themselves, right? But usually you have an ending point, and you have a next and previous segment. You're on the current segment that you're on. Um, and another important thing about paths in the context of what we're going to be talking about, paths do have a width, but really it's like a radius. So imagine a line is your path, a given segment of a path, and you have a radius off of that path. So in 2D, that would create a sort of, you know, line, like a, like a little rectangle. And in 3D, that would create a cylinder um, or like a, you know, sphere, uh, a circular cross section. Um, and that's a really important thing because we, if we only have the segment, the line segment, then the concept of being on the path and off the path doesn't exist because uh, a line segment is infinitesimally small of course. So you do need to have some width to this uh, line, otherwise we don't know what being on the path is. Um, we, we, we can't determine if we're on it or not. Um, so consider just quickly the nature of a, of a path, right? The more acute your angle, the harder it is to make a turn. And so when you want to represent a curve, it's better to utilize more points, otherwise the sort of change in behavior that's required to go from one segment to the next is much more difficult for an agent to kind of figure out. Now, of course, good um, algorithms will determine this no matter what. However, if you want to create a game and a simulation that does its best, uh, that looks good and works well, adding more points doesn't hurt. 
Um, and, and so, you know, sometimes you can't avoid it. Say uh, the left may be something you programmatically code in. On the right, perhaps that's the output of your A star pathfinding algorithm that's kind of noisy. And so um, in many cases, it's smart to maybe average them or do other things. Um, but keep in mind that more points tend to be better uh, given that they're jagged curves versus smooth curves. So discontinuous discontinuity in paths will result in negative uh, effects. Uh, also keep in mind your environment, right? Ultimately, if a character will follow a path and if that path goes through a tree and it doesn't know any better, um, say you have physics on, it'll never get, you know, actually make it through the tree. And if you don't, it'll look like this character is going through a tree, which is a bummer. So, you know, just make sure that you, when you do pathfinding, you consider your environment uh, as well. Obviously, this is what path uh, finding algorithms uh, will, will give you. Um, but yeah, it, generally it's good to have the path physically represented in your simulation uh, so both you can understand, um, you know, you can understand what's going on and the simulation can, uh, you know, be clear and you can debug it well and it's also clear to the user um, that the behavior uh, should be expected. Um, yeah. So let's talk a little about the simple, a simple algorithm for path following. So simple path following here's some, you know, basically you create a bunch of waypoints, you seek the next waypoint. Uh, when you get to, when you get close enough to a particular waypoint, you seek the next waypoint. So you're not even looking at the edges any, at this point. You're just looking at the series of waypoints and you're just sort of saying, okay, next, 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 next. Every time you get close to one, it's like next, you know, that's, it's almost like, uh, you know, like a, a, a trail of breadcrumbs. You, you, okay, you get to one, you look for the next one, okay, next one, you go to the next one, you eat it, and so on. It's a very simple algorithm. Uh, the, the benefits, right, it's very simple, it's very easy to understand, it's very easy to build, um, and it works pretty well for a single individual character following a path, um, actually. Uh, the downside is it's not really good for multiple agents. Um, they don't, uh, there's an issue, right, you may other efforts or other energies or, and, and uh, forces may push them aside and then ultimately create really wacky sort of behaviors. Um, and then you'll find that followers tend to converge at these waypoints um, and, and they create kind of these predictable lines between them. It doesn't have this sort of more natural feel. Um, and, this, and, and in particular, this behavior doesn't work too well when you're in dealing with op, uh, objects going, you know, in contradiction to your own path um, and uh, it, it's when you add this with separation in particular with flocking uh, things can get really twitchy uh, because of all these conflicting behaviors all at once so um, just to kind of talk about this right here is an example of a simple path um, and, and basically we go through each waypoint given a starting point and we calculate our location relative to its location and then we seek it out using a seek steering force. Um, and so you go to the first spot, you get close to the next one, you go to, uh, when you get close to that spot, you go to the next one and so on and so forth. Um, you create a list of these spots, as you know, and uh, you go through them one by one. And if you get to the last one, then you're done. Or if it's a cyclical, uh, if you want it to be kind of a loop, then what you do is you can, you know, use something like a, uh, like, um, like a queue, right? You pop off the queue, you follow that one, and then when uh, you're done, when you get to it, you take the point that you're currently, you push it into the queue and you pop off the next one, and that way you're constantly taking elements off of the queue and pushing them back into the bottom, and you're constantly uh, going through them. If you don't want to use a queue, uh, there's an alternative thing called a circular buffer. It's a static um, thing. What you do is you have a set buffer like an array and then you have a pointer to a particular element that you're on and you kind of increment it and when you get to the end you go back to the beginning um, and it's just sort of like at the end of the buffer you just go back to the beginning. Um, very effective, very memory efficient um, and, and very very fast. Uh, so if you have a lot of waypoints and you want to um, use them in a cycle, then a uh, circular buffer could be very powerful. In particular, if you're consuming multiple waypoints at once, uh, which you'll see why you may want to do that. 
Um, so let's talk a little bit about more complex path following, um, in particular for multiple uh, agents. So here's the idea, right? There's uh, two um, approaches, Reynolds and Schiffman, which we'll talk about each one individually. Uh, but ultimately, the key here is what we do is we try to figure out, will we be on or off the path given um, you know, in, in the future? And there's two different ways to do this, both in Reynolds and Schiffman's case, which we'll talk about individually. But ultimately, here you can see that the radius of the path comes into play, where you, the path is a, 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 a certain width, and if we can calculate our location or our future location relative to that path, so like what's the minimum distance between that location, either our current location or a future location, to the path, right? If we can calculate that distance, we can tell if we're on the path or not, because if the if that distance is greater than the radius of the path, then we're off. If the if the radius is lesser than uh, if is if our distance is lesser than that distance of the radius, then we're on the path, right? So if we can calculate that, we can then determine, okay, we're on the path or we're off the path. Um, and then we can kind of figure out what we need to do to get back on the path and what we need to do to maintain our trajectory on the path. Uh, and this is a little bit harder. There's a little bit more, you know, stuff going on. We'll talk about how we can do that. And so let's talk a little bit about what we would do um, if, uh, if we're on the path and our future location is on the path. Well, say we're, we're the bottom left agent and we're moving in a particular direction and we calculate, okay, our future direction is going to be still on the path. Well, we're okay. We don't need to change our you know, trajectory. We don't need to do anything. Let's leave it alone. Um, say we're the top left agent. We're way off the path already. We know that. And our, you know, our future position is also off the path. Well, that means we could potentially be steering closer uh, to the path than we currently are. Uh, you know, than where we are right now. So if we're, say, on the path, but our future location is off the path, as you can see in the bottom right agent, then this agent needs to steer to the left to stay on the path. And again, in the top right uh, agent here, you can see if we're on the path and our future location is still on the path, even if it crosses sort of that path, we're still good and we don't need to change our thing. So you can see as the radius of the path sort of reduces, this requires more acute changes to our agent's behavior. And as it's wider, it requires less and more kind of, um, you know, uh, wide or broad changes to our behavior. Uh, but ultimately, it works the same way in both cases. And so to do this, what we need to do is, A, we need to figure out our future position of our agent. Um, we need to find the nearest segment to that future position. And if the future position is going to be off this path, then we need to seek the closest point on the nearest segment, meaning we have our future position and we find the nearest segment to that position, then we can kind of draw a line. That's the minimum distance. If that minimum distance to that a particular point on the path, if that minimum distance is more than the radius, we determine what that point is on the path that results in the minimum distance, and then we seek that point. And if it's not greater, if the minimum distance is lesser than the radius, then we don't have to do anything. We're gonna, our future position will be on the path. Uh, the pros is that this works really well for multiple agents following a path. You can kind of see it's not really forcing us onto a line. It's forcing us into a behavior and to kind of like a range of behaviors. The downside is it's a little bit more complicated. As you can hear, it requires um, a little bit more kind of uh, thought and implementation to make this work. So sometimes uh, we talked about our future position. We need to predict where we will be in the future. Uh, we've talked about this already in terms of pursuit and evade, uh, and also in terms of obstacle uh, avoidance, where we've, you know, did, uh, we basically tried to figure out if something is going to collide with us by sort of creating this like narrow, um, almost hallway, uh, and seeing if an object exists in that hallway and collides with it or not. Um, and, and in this case, uh, we can do something very similar. We can either try to intersect the path and create kind of a minimum distance that way, or we can just take a, a given time step of our velocity and figure out at this next time step, like our, our next frame, are we going to be on or off the path? Uh, there's a couple of different approaches to this as well. 
Um, so there's a couple of, you know, these two options. There's the Schiffman approach, which Schiffman says that to, to figure out the closest point, what you do is you figure out the, um, the, the point n line uh, n time steps from now and with Reynolds you just find the closest point to the line segment now um, and you can kind of imagine that the Schiffman approach is better this results in a much much more smooth movement um, you don't necessarily have to do full-on intersection and projection but uh, having a number of steps and figuring out how many time steps from today from now you're going to be on or off the path um, allows you to make slightly better decisions in terms of the behavior you want to apply to your agent in that particular frame. So uh, let's kind of talk a little bit about this algorithm. So in this example, we've got our vehicle uh, with our agent. It's off the path. And if it still continues to go in this direction that it's going, it's going to still be off the path. So how do we know that we're off the path? First, we, we, fall, we find this FP, our future position. It's based on our velocity and our orientation, of course. And, uh, and, we, can, and we, we can see visually here, we can see that the closest point to that future position, CP, is, is kind of perpendicular to that segment, um, which uh, if you recall, there's a way to calculate that um, point on the segment I'll let you pause the video now if you'd like to kind of figure this out on your own. Um, but yeah, whatever. So the uh, first, the, the, the future position is clearly off the path. But to do that, all we have to do is if we could draw a line between the future position and the closest point and measure the magnitude of that, we would see then that that value, that magnitude is larger than the radius, which uh, the width of that blue line the blue segment is actually two times the radius, right? Because you go up and down. Um, and so that's how we know that it's off the path. And so to, if you recall the dot product, the way we would figure out the, um, lo this, the closest point is we would take point B, um, we would create a vector from FP minus B, so BFP, whatever. And then we take the projection of that onto uh, the, the segment vector, which, you know, keep in mind the segment vector is that next point, we'll call it C, it's not on here, uh, but C minus B, that's the segment, and then we would uh, effectively uh, take the dot product of that um, and do the, and multiply it by the, uh, the magnitude of the uh, uh, I think of VFP, right? I think what's the adjacent equals the yeah, you'd multiply the magnitude of BFP, which we should be able to calculate relatively easily, um, times the uh, dot product of BFP and, and the segment. And uh, that will give you the magnitude on CP. So it'd give you that projection magnitude. And so to get the actual CP um, point, you would um, multiply the normal, the normalized segment by that value. Um, anyways, you know, if you need to review that, just look at the dot product um, lecture or slides, but ultimately you should remember how to project a vector onto another vector using the dot product. Um, right. Here we go. Here's the equation. Clearly, it was in the slides. I was just testing you. Haha. -ha. Um, yeah. So ultimately, CP is equal to B plus the normalized segment times the projection, which we calculated, uh, as I mentioned before, with the dot product. Um, so if that distance is greater than the radius, then we're off the path. If it's less than that, we're on the path. So that's really it, right? And, and if we're off the path, what we do is we would calculate the, um, that, that, that steering force from the future point to the closest point. And you can kind of, if you remember, uh, pursue, this is a pursuit type of behavior. Also keep in mind, uh, you could do this for multiple time steps. You don't have to do it for just one. And if you do it for multiple time steps, you can kind of figure out, uh, in particular, when you fall off the path, right? And if, say, you fall off the path in a given number of time steps, then perhaps for every incremental time step, you apply a 
some amount of steering force, maybe not the full one. So the, for the first one, for the first you know step, that's like the maximum steering force. And the next one's like half that steering force and then one half of that, right? And so that way you can do it for maybe four or five time steps. And that way you can sort of say, well, we're not gonna be off the path now, but in two or three time steps, we're gonna be off the path. So let's apply a steering force, but a lesser one, a slightly lesser one. And you can even do this for multiple. And so that way, if you have a really wiggly path, you can kind of try to average through. Um, and so, yeah, there's a lot of ways to kind of utilize this in a more eloquent fashion and in more and a little bit more sophisticated, like a more more depth of um, uh, quality. So how do we figure out what our segment is and when do we choose the next segment? Is the next segment always the right choice? So this is a bit of a hard question, right? And unlike the first algorithm, we are not going just by a list of um, segments. We are uh, effectively trying to, you know, we're, path, we're following a path unrelated to, um, to the order almost of the points. So there's a couple of ways uh, to deal with this. And, and ultimately you can kind of see this from the image you sort of want to figure out where our future point, uh, how, where, where is the closest it's going to be to the path. So in this case, right, we're looking at the um, future point. And we can see the future point is closer to uh, option C than it is to option B, right? Uh, there's a bit of nuance here because you can see this option A in a way, is it closer than option C or option A? Option C looks closer. However, option A is pretty close. How do we know, say option A is closer, that it's not there? Well, we, we do need to take a look at the magnitude of these segments, right? So say option A came out to be the closest. Well, now we have to make sure that option A, that, that closest point on segment A, which is the segment that's cut off on the left here, is actually on segment A. And how do we determine that segment A, that, that closest point is actually on segment A? Well, we take the uh, magnitude, the uh, like say the closest point minus point A, which point A here is cut off on the, on the left of the screen. So closest point minus A, the magnitude of that cannot be greater than the magnitude of the segment, which would here be point B, call it an A. So if you do get a segment that is closer, but actually there's no segment there, you just have to ensure that the closest point sits on that segment. Um, and that way you can kind of go through and figure out, okay, which segment has the minimum, like the, what has the minimum distance. Now, should you do this for every single segment in your path? What if you have a really, really large set of things? Also, how do you deal with a situation where uh, the path kind of gets closer? And so what you can do is you can deal with a certain ordering, um, right? You can say, okay, we're only gonna consider 10 points in the future and 10 points behind us. So if you have, say, a figure eight type of path, right, at that intersection, uh, the points in front and behind you are, are going to be on that particular line of the, of the intersection, whereas the other line of the intersection will be in a different part of the vector of uh, of the array because if you don't do that um, and it's just any point any time well then your agent doesn't necessarily know which path to take right and it could in theory kind of accidentally go like go on a figure eight and then all of a sudden one time it's like oh the other way because the whatever the numbers just kind of jumbled up so you do have to kind of employ a different set of techniques depending on the behavior that you want. If you want your agent to just be completely opportunistic and just follow whatever's closest, great. Uh, you may have your agent start to do things that you don't intend to do. If you want it to follow a strict path with some kind of directionality, for example, you may want to employ other things like a lookup against that particular segment that gives a directionality or only look at a certain number of you know, segments ahead and behind um, or maybe only segments ahead, and then we kind of added it in the circular buffer, as we talked about before. But ultimately, the two things you're really doing here that's critical is determining which segment is closest to that future point, and uh, making sure that that closest point is actually on our path. 
Uh, so if you find the closest point, the other thing it has to ensure it to, to actually be the segment that we're going to be going to is that um, you know the, the segment actually extends out to that closest point. It's not just an imaginary point as we have here in option A. So uh, here are some suggestions for making a path. Uh, object architecture is always better than no object architecture. So in this case, we would create a waypoint prefab and we can add these, uh, you know, we can drag these to your path. So you can literally have, imagine objects like little spheres uh, that represent a waypoint. Um, and, you know, you can set them in order. You can create something pretty sophisticated that looks like a path. And that when you run the game, it gets deleted, like the objects get, you know, in, go invisible or something. So it's just for your own, um, you know, uh, use case. I also believe that Unity has these things called gizmos that you can kind of, you know, do yourself. Like you can build them yourself or you can use debug lines as well to visualize these things. Um, but yeah, each waypoint would be, uh, you know, be, be then pulled in into a data structure in an order of some kind, hopefully an order that follows the path that you created in your game. Um, and then you effectively test this array by having a character seek each point uh, until it's close. And then again, going from one to the next to the next, if you're using the first algorithm or uh, try to figure out which segment, which path segment is closest. Um, and then uh, you can actually, you know, continue to extrapolate on this um, architecture and add more um, information to each class and more info about each waypoint um, in that. So, for example, some data that could you could you maybe want uh, for each waypoint. You want to have a uh, start point and an end point and a vector from A to B, uh, the unit vector of that A to B and the magnitude of A to B. And that way you can do this without having to uh, recalculate everything. Uh, then you can have these debug lines that will will demonstrate to you in the editor what uh, what the path is. Also, you can have objects that then disappear, or you can use gizmos if you want to look into that. Um, and then you have the constructor that will actually set up the data fields and calculate everything for you, uh, as well as the closest point, uh, which will return this function that will turn the closest point given another point. And also, you could theoretically tell you whether or not that point is on the path or not. Um, but this is just a suggestion. There's a lot of other ways to do this. So, you know, do whatever works best for you. Um, sometimes your agents will kind of move around the path spastically. How can you kind of chill them out? Well, you can align them to the, uh, to the path. So you can apply an alignment function, al alignment uh, force, much like we talked about in the uh, flocking lecture, but you can do that to the vector, to the direction of the path. So not only is it trying to follow the path, but it's also trying to align itself to the path. And this will kind of smooth out the movement of the character. Uh, the other thing we mentioned this already is you can have multiple time steps uh, and, and kind of calculate sort of an incremental reduction in, in uh, steering force based on whether or not the um, agent is on or off the path. And what this will ultimately do is it will sort of average out the ultimate um, steering force and will kind of reduce the speed uh, sporadicness because say you're for the next five time steps you're on the path for three and off the path for two right you're only going to have um, a reduced uh, amount versus you're going to go and then the next one you have to move you know so it's it's going to be a little bit more gradual um, another issue is agents will collide uh, often if they're following similar path finding or path uh, following algorithms and so what we can do is we can apply a flea force, effectively a separation force, like we did with flocking. Um, and that way we can ensure that we try to keep our distance from other uh, agents that are on the path. That's one way to do it. You can also do collision detection, uh, like a, like a obstacle avoidance against this. So say there's an agent in front of us, we're gonna reduce our speed uh, to not hit them uh, and that kind of thing. Um, so we don't necessarily just have to use flee. We could also use other behaviors such as like imagine being in line at a, at a theme park, right? When somebody in front of you moves, you get up close to them and then you stop, you don't keep going. So uh, there are other, you're not, you don't run away from them either, right? So you don't go and hit somebody behind you. And it's not the sort of contention situation where you're 
stuck between two people, right? Uh, you, you go up and you stop because there's somebody in your way. So you slow down based on uh, how much space you have in front of you. So that's it for uh, flocking, for path following, and um, for both simple and complex, as well as uh, the other thing we talked about this week. Um, yeah, that's about it, and uh, excited to see what you all do do with this stuff. All right? Bye-bye.